Okay, we're ready to get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first BFV Office Hours webinar. I'm Jeff Berman, and I'm one of the shareholders at BFV, and I have corporate and transactional practice. Just want to take a, a minute to remind you what we do at BFV. Um, we assist clients in all phases of their operations and in the corporate life cycle from formation to, su to succession, including transactions, litigation, and dispute resolution, commercial real estate matters, as well as non-compete, trade secrets, employment, business and real estate litigation. Our clients do business throughout Georgia, across the US, and internationally. Thank you for spending your lunch with us today. It was great to see many names on the registration list that I know and I've worked with. And also want to thank everyone who sent in questions. Uh, Kim Winkler is going to do his best to answer as many of those as he can. And keep in mind, you're not alone <clears throat> with the questions you've asked. We grapple with these issues also. A few housekeeping matters. First of all, the State Bar of Georgia would like me to say that this is not legal advice. It's a webinar and Kenny is giving, will be giving his opinions, but again, it's not legal advice. During the webinar, if you want to send a question, please use the Q&A tab in your control panel. Do not use the chat or raise hand function. Neither of those will work to get a question in. Our goal is to keep this to 45 minutes. Timing is important to us, and we know your time is important. If you do submit a question today and it is not answered, we will do our best to respond to it. <clears throat> With that, I want to introduce Ken Winkler, one of my law partners. <clears throat> Ken is going to discuss, as the title suggests, relaunching our business, returning to work, employment issues. Many of you know Ken. He is unbelievable at explaining detailed, complicated matters in a way that's easy to understand. So I really look forward to Kenny today talking. And so, Ken, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thank you. It's my uh, privilege to be able to uh, share some information today with you all. As Jeff mentioned, we received numerous questions from participants leading into the webinar, which is indicative of the complexity of issues employers are facing dealing the COVID-19 crisis. So in the time that we have, we're going to try to address as many of the most commonly asked questions that have been presented. Uh, let me give you a quick overview of a roadmap of where we're going to be going. Uh, during our time today. Uh, the topics are, I'm gonna address unemployment in the state of Georgia and give you an update on recent happenings uh, regarding unemployment, uh, give an overview about liability issues. You know, common question is, can I get sued when I bring my employees back to work? We'll talk about how to prepare your work site in a safe way and the considerations you should undertake. We're gonna talk about how do you get your employees back to work best practices and screening and addressing legal questions about what can you ask and what are you allowed to test for. And finally, uh, we're gonna be grappling with handling employees who refuse to return to work, which I anticipate is gonna be a big challenge for, for many of you listening. One of the most challenging issues employers have faced during the COVID-19 crisis has been complying with the Georgia Department of Labor's emergency partial unemployment rule that went into effect in March. The emergency rule requires employers to file unemployment claims on behalf of their employees whenever it is necessary to have reduced their normal work hours or there is no work at all such as when you place an employee on an unpaid leave of absence or a furlough. So this was a drastic change in the way that unemployment claims are filed. Typically employees file on their behalf. The Department of Labor understanding that they were gonna be uh, just crushed really 
with the number of filing of claims, came up with a system where the employers would submit a template each week where they would be filing the claims for the employees whose hours have been reduced. So on your screen, you're gonna see a summary of the major key components of the partial unemployment emergency rule. Again, the main one was that employers have the burden of submitting a weekly template or submission for the employees whose hours were reduced. They also remove the requirement that employees have to pursue other work during this period of time, because there's an understanding that there's not really a lot of jobs out there, so employees are not burdened with trying to show that they look for jobs in order to qualify for benefits. And the Department of Labor also extended the weekly benefit uh, eligibility weeks from 14 to 26. So under the state of Georgia unemployment rules, individuals who qualify for unemployment benefits are now entitled to 26 weeks of unemployment benefits. And as I mentioned, I'll mention in a minute, 13 additional weeks has been provided by the federal government. This is a screenshot of the Georgia Department of Labor website homepage. I'm showing you this because this is a great source to find information about unemployment. The Georgia Department of Labor posts FAQs, blog posts, tutorials, seminars, and handbook guides, among many other things, as helpful resources, both to employers and to individuals. It really, I can't stress enough how important it is, given how quickly things are changing, to look at this website on a regular basis if you're trying to keep up with developments regarding unemployment and how you process claims. Even this week, uh, they launched a new program that we're gonna talk about um, in a minute. And so just, I encourage you, look at the website on the screen. You'll see there's links to all sorts of resources, just a tremendous resource for you to get answers to many questions you might have. In addition to the state unemployment laws, the federal government, through the CARES Act, expanded the amount of unemployment benefits available and also increased the number of individuals who could receive unemployment benefits. What I've provided here is a chart so you can keep track of these three major components of the CARES Act and keep track of the timing and, the, and what they each provide. And there's a lot of acronyms being floated around in the COVID-19 area in employment law. We're always using acronyms. Um, so you'll see PUA, PUC, PEUC. So let me just touch upon what these each provide. The Pandemic Unemployment Assistant Program provides unemployment benefits to individuals who typically are not entitled to unemployment benefits, such as self-employed independent contractors, those that receive 1099s, and gig workers, as well as other individuals who might not otherwise qualify for unemployment benefits if they're able to establish that the reason they can't work is due to COVID-19 reasons. And these benefits are gonna be extended through December 31st, 2020. So PUA, it tends to be the most complicated part of the CARES Act that deals with unemployment. There's a lot of technical rules about it, uh, but nonetheless, it does provide coverage to those otherwise ineligible. PUC is the provision that is probably you're more familiar with and have heard a lot about. That is where the federal government is providing a, an additional $600 per week benefit to any individual who is eligible for at least $1 of state unemployment benefits. So in the state of Georgia, if one of your employees is eligible to receive at least $1 of unemployment benefits under the state system, they will also be entitled to an additional $600 per week through July 31st. And the third component of the CARES Act that dealt with unemployment was the PEUC, the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Portion, and that extends the duration of state unemployment by an additional 13 weeks. So as things stand today in the state of Georgia, 
employees will be entitled to a total of 39 weeks, potentially, of unemployment benefits, 26 weeks from the state, and then an additional 13 weeks under the CARES Act PEUC program. Now, as employers reopen their business, questions are going to arise about the process for transitioning employees from unemployment back to full employment. In anticipation of this and some of the challenges they know employers are going to have getting their employees back to work, the Georgia Department of Labor this week is in the process of rolling out what it calls a claims conversion program. The claims conversion program is an online tool that is gonna allow the employer to indicate when they permanently lay an employee off. They can do that electronically so that the partial unemployment claim from the employer is gonna transition from an employer filed claim to an individual filed claim. So under certain circumstances, employers are no longer going to have to file partial unemployment claims. And here are a couple scenarios that employers need to keep in mind when it comes to unemployment when you're bringing your people back to work. So one scenario is, is when you restore the employee's hours back to what they were pre-COVID-19 crisis. And the Department of Labor is directing employers that when business operations do resume to normal operations as it was prior to COVID-19 crisis, employers should discontinue submitting employer filed partial claims for any employee who returns to the regular normal work schedule and is earning more than the weekly benefit amount plus $300. So the state has a system in which they determine how much the weekly benefit amount is. Employers will get that information either by letter or you can access it online. Uh, through this conversion program. And you need to ensure that if you are returning people back to work, even if you're restoring their hours, if they are not earning at least their weekly benefit amount plus $300, you need to continue filing partial unemployment claims. If you're paying them more than this amount, then you can stop submitting partial unemployment claims. Another situation is if you decide that you have to permanently lay off someone who was on furlough or, had, or who had reduced hours, there you go to the portal, the conversion portal, and electronically you're gonna be able to designate those individuals that you're transferring from a, a layoff to a permanent layoff. And that's all done electronically. Now this part is very important. What do you do about employees who refuse to return to work or self-quarantine, et cetera? In those situations, the Department of Labor is encouraging employee, employers to stop submitting partial unemployment claims for those employees. So if you reach out to an employee and recall them, they say, I'm not ready to come back to work and there's work available, you are instructed to take them off of the partial unemployment submission each week. And in addition, the Department of Labor would like you, they're encouraging you to go to their website and there's a section dealing with fraud and there you uh, submit information about the individual who's refusing to come back to work. That doesn't mean by doing that that the employee actually committed fraud. It just means that the department's going to have information so they can make an individual assessment as to whether or not that individual is entitled to unemployment benefits or not. The way things stand today, it's probably likely that if the employee has a COVID-19 reason why they are not coming back to work, I suspect that the Department of Labor is still going to grant those people unemployment benefits. The good news, however, is that anyone that is entitled to unemployment benefits for COVID-19 related reasons, the employer's unemployment ratings do not get dinged for that. On this slide, uh, I have the web page uh, site. You can click on that link and that's gonna take you to the Claims Conversion Program seminar that the Department of Labor posted this week that explains this process in more detail. So that's sort of an Can overview of where we are with the state unemployment system. Sorry to interrupt your flow. There's a question that many people have asked uh, that many employers are very nervous about resuming office operations and they're concerned what happens and what is their potential exposure if, if one of the 
employees get sick. It's my understanding <clears throat> that the government has not yet provided immunity, which we're all hoping they will, I think. Um, should employers be nervous? <clears throat> what type of claims could they face? Yeah, I, I would say employers should be concerned, um, nervous, concerned, uh, semantics, but definitely they should be concerned when there's no immunity in place. Um, there are liability issues to be aware of. One of the issues and challenges with COVID-19 is how do you know there's going to be a, a problem ca demonstrating causation, right? So if someone gets sick and they're trying to blame someone, I, I got sick, who can I blame for my illness? One of the challenges people are going to have is how do you prove where you got the illness? How are you going to prove that you got it at work? Typically, workers' compensation is where uh, individuals who are injured or through an accident at work have coverage. Um, so workers' compensation may turn out to be an area where most of these claims are handled. Uh, the state of California, by example, the governor there issued an executive order that states that there is a presumption, a rebuttable presumption, that anyone who gets COVID-19, who, from an employment standpoint, the presumption is they got it at work. So that's just one state that has decided that they want these types of claims covered by workers' compensation. That's one area of potential exposure. There's a lot of creative plaintiff's attorneys that are already filing lawsuits under state tort theories. Uh, those can range from negligence for not complying with CDC standards, for example. There is public nuisance lawsuits that have been filed, I know, against at least one fast food uh, franchisor claiming that their standards weren't up to par and sort of taking a public nuisance route to it. And then we have a whole gambit of all the other employment laws that govern the workplace pre-COVID-19. So employers need to be mindful of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I know one of the questions someone raises, is COVID-19 actually a disability? I think the jury's out on whether or not COVID-19 in and of itself is a disability. It might depend on the severity of someone's illness and the length of it, uh, typically temporary uh, setbacks like the flu are not necessarily disabilities. But in the ADA context, you're going to have issues about whether or not you have to accommodate someone that has an underlying condition and may not want to come back to work. There's confidentiality provisions we're going to touch upon today where you can't disclose confidential medical information to coworkers. Age discrimination, when you recall people back to work, can you choose not to call back people in sort of these vulnerable age groups that the White House has said that for the time being, they should be sheltered in place. Uh, there's another federal law, the Genetic Discrimination uh, Act, GINA. Most people aren't really familiar about that, but there's limitations on what type of information you can ask about family members' health. We've got the Families First Corona Relief Act, uh, the FFCRA, that was enacted April 1st, and that provides additional sick leave and, and paid leave for individuals who can't work for COVID-19 related reasons and taking care of children. And then you have the FMLA and then the National Labor Relations Act. And so let me just touch upon the National Labor Relations Act because many of you probably are not unionized and you're asking yourself, well, why do I need to be concerned about the National Labor Relations Act? Well, the National Labor Relations Act applies to both unionized and non-unionized workplaces. The National Labor Re Re Relations Act prohibits retaliation, for example, against any employee who engages in what's called protective concerted activity. Protected ex concerted activity occurs when someone is speaking out about the terms and conditions of their employment on behalf of themselves and coworkers. So if an employee posts on social media complaints about the safety conditions of their work environment and you don't like it and you wanna take some type of an employment action, you need to be careful because that's likely considered to be protected concerted activity protected under the National Labor Relations Act. And I just read a, a legal update today that unions are filling a void right now. They're being very aggressive, providing information to non-unionized employees about what to do if they feel they're working in an unsafe work environment. So I do anticipate that union activity um, is going to increase. And if you're a non-unionized employer, pay very particular attention to this. And it's just another reason why you want to be very careful 
to make sure that you treat your employees very well and thoughtfully uh, during this crisis. So one of the best things I can suggest at this point strategically to avoid these types of liability is to make sure you're following guidance from OSHA and from the CDC. Both OSHA and the CDC have provided guidelines. This is not necessarily law, but they're helpful guidelines, and some of them are very industry specific. So I encourage you to go to the CDC website, OSHA website, look at the materials that they have there, really get a thorough understanding and grasp of the suggestions they have and how to ensure a safe workplace and some of the strategies that they're encouraging you to undertake. Because things are developing and evolving very rapidly, I again stress to keep up with this and look at these resources on a regular basis, if not daily, certainly weekly. Kenny, I'm gonna interrupt again. As, as you know, and as many people know, uh, BFB is still working remotely. And we have formed a, a task force, a team from within our office to monitor best practice for us to eventually return to the office. Undoubtedly, many of the people who are listening today have already started the process or are in the process of thinking about returning. You've already jumped to the slide, um, preparing to return to the website. So if, if, you, could, if you could highlight for us um, really what, what employers should do um, in terms of planning to return to the office. Yeah, Jeff, one of the first things um, I would say is to recognize that there is no prize for opening quickly. I just sense that there's a lot of sort of like peer pressure out there that now that business is opening up, I know I've talked to a lot of clients and they just feel sort of this pressure that they now have to quickly get back to normal. And I would consider reopening only when you feel you're able to do so safely and when it makes business sense to do so. Universally, all these government agencies, including the CDC, they're still encouraging remote work wherever possible in returning employees in stages. So I'd also keep in mind that your ability to resume normalcy is also going to depend on when your employees are comfortable coming back to work. You can't really force everyone to come back if they think it's unsafe. Many restaurants, for example, they are currently having problems getting certainly their lower wage earners to return, in part because they're making more money on unemployment. So my point is you may not have as much control as you think about when you're going to be fully operational. I think you need to take into account the anxiety levels of your employees and do everything you can to ensure that you have a safe work environment from day one when they come back to work. So as BFE is doing, I'd encourage you to first start a task force if you haven't done that already. There's just simply too much information for one person to gather, understand, and figure out. So get a team of people to review the websites, review best practices. You wanna develop a return to work plan. You need to anticipate training people uh, on the rules and the policies and how you're gonna enforce them in the workplace. Communication leading into this is very important. I suggest having one voice. In other words, have one person from the company be responsible for sharing information and updates with your workforce. That'll lead to some consistency and remove confusion. And then I've listed here just bullets of some of the obvious things that hopefully a lot of you've already been paying attention to of some of the uh, things you need to be aware of. Providing masks and PPE, obviously enhanced cleaning and disinfecting in the office. Elevator occupancy is something to consider. In our building, uh, our building is limiting two people per elevator. So we need to take that into consideration when we think about, well, how, how logistically are people gonna get up to our office, which is several floors up? Uh, I would also suggest where you can and where it's not costing you more money to go above and beyond some of these standards. Let me just give you one example. Floor markings and social distancing. Everyone knows six feet is sort of what they're recommending. You might've been in restaurants or buildings and you see the markers on the floor, they're six feet apart. Look, if you're in a situation where from a number standpoint, you can expand those markings to maybe eight feet, like go ahead and do so. In the event you're ever sued or someone claims that they got sick, it's always better to be able to demonstrate that you just didn't do the minimum or what the CD suggested, 
but you went above and beyond that. And floor markings is just a simple, uh, has no money involved, but you can just space out the markings on the floor beyond six feet to increase people's safety perhaps, show that you're serious about it. And again, if you're ever challenged, you're able to say, I went above and beyond sort of what was recommended by the CDC. So those are some of the things to, as you look through this list, uh, thinking about staggered work shifts, non-essential travel. Uh, these are all things that you need to consider and ideally put in some type of a policy to share with your employees. Kenny, I'm going to ask another question if I can. Um, <clears throat> many of us know the White House has already produced guidelines for opening up America again, and it's a three-phased approach. The first phase deals with and encourages vulnerable individuals to continue to shelter in place. Um, can employers choose not to bring those folks back to work to protect them? So that's a great question and it creates a real challenge where employers who are trying to do the right thing might actually be uh, running afoul of the law. So the EEOC and some of their guidance address this very question and ask, can you base decisions on higher risk underlying conditions or vulnerable age groups? And what the EEOC guidance says is no, you can't. Uh, the ADA, for example, does not allow the employer to exclude employees solely because the employee has a disability that the CDC identifies as potentially placing him at higher risk for severe illness if he gets COVID-19, unless there is a direct threat to the employee's safety. Um, so in other words, uh, just because you think someone's a high risk, you can't exclude them and bring other people back to work first. And I, as you see, there's an exclusion for direct threat, but direct threat is a very high standard. You need to look at different elements such as the duration of the risk, the nature and severity of the potential harm, the likelihood that harm will occur, and the imminence of potential danger. So it's a very high mark. Similarly, with people that are older, um, those uh, 65 and older, the White House says, you know what, uh, they should not be coming back to work in phase one and phase two, even though that's what the White House is suggesting. The EOC says that, well, that'd be age discrimination if you did not choose to bring those people back to work out of just concern about their safety. So there's some inherent conflict between the White House guidelines, uh, their return to work plans, and what the EOC is currently stating. And you know what, there's sometimes there's just not great answers to this. One of the solutions is just to come up with, you know, nothing forces you to bring these people back to work. Uh, you can certainly accommodate them. And if you do accommodate people when you don't necessarily have to, you might want to memorialize that understanding and make the employee understand that this is just a temporary modification or a temporary accommodation and that things might change later where they will have to return to the workplace. Kenny, can I ask a question here? In terms of the ADA, who does, what employers does that apply to? So 15 or more. So if you're a small employee, um, employer with less than that, then you're not covered by the ADA. But beyond that amount, uh, you're covered by the ADA. And then also be aware, you know, this is Georgia. In other states, uh, they have their own discrimination laws. So if you're an employer with multi-state operations, you always, always have to be mindful of the state laws that might pr have more protections and more reach than the federal laws. Okay. So we got a lot of questions about medical testing. Let me, in the time we have, just kind of go through a lot of these, these questions. And certainly if you'd like some more detailed explanations, you just reach out to us. Uh, the ADA does permit employers to make disability related inquiries if they're job related and consistent with business necessity and understanding the severity of COVID-19 and we're in a pandemic. The EOC is loosening some of their prior guidelines. So may an employer administered a COVID-19 test before permitting employees to enter the workplace? Yes. Uh, there's no guidance yet on whether you can repeat testing once people are back, but as a threshold, you can have the test. Can you take temperatures of employees? Yes. The EOC said yes, that, that is permissible. May an employer have an employee answer questions? So can you issue a questionnaire and ask people before they come back to work whether they're suffering from any symptoms such as fever, cough, chills, et cetera? Yes, that is permissible. That does not run afoul of the ADA. May employers ask about the health of an employee's family members? 
So while there's no ADA violation, GINA, this is the law that deals with genetic information, actually prohibits this type of question um, because genetic information does include information about family members. So if you ask this question, you would may be violating GINA. A better way to get the same information is just to ask employees if they have been exposed to someone with COVID-19 that would not run afoul of GINA. Main employer ask employees now if they will need reasonable accommodations in the future. In the past, the EOC has taken a position that you can't ask one of those, that, that type of a question that violates the ADA, but because we're in a pandemic, they're saying, yes, now you can. So this might be a helpful way to figure out as you're going back to work, what type of accommodations, maybe PPE, people are gonna need as you ramp up and prepare to return to the workplace. So this is, again, one of these areas where the EOC is loosening up some of its prior rules and guidelines. May an employer reveal the identity of an employee who tests positive for COVID-19? Very important that you understand that no, you are not permitted to give out the name to coworkers of an employee who tests positive for COVID-19. There's some different exceptions for staffing companies, but otherwise, uh, generally, you cannot disclose that information. Under the ADA confidentiality rules, you need to keep medical information confidential. That's always been the law under the ADA, and it complies now. So any information about COVID-19 testing results needs to be kept separately from a personnel file. And then there's some similar questions about what do you do if an employee has symptoms or actually tests positive for COVID-19? Yes, you can have those employees stay home. You're allowed to remove them from the workplace and keep them at home. That's what the CDC is uh, suggesting and the EEOC is in agreement. On this slide, I've laid out just a couple uh, steps you might wanna go through in the event that someone reports that they are COVID-19 positive. You do wanna confirm the diagnosis and timing so you can undertake some tracing, isolate and quarantine any of the infected employees. Uh, those that were in contact, the CDC suggests a 14-day quarantine. You're going to want to notify any employees who may have been exposed to that employee without, again, revealing the person's name. Clean and disinfect work areas. And where you're required under state laws, notify the Department of Health or comply with OSHA notification standards, uh, which may apply to your business depending on your industry and your size. Many questions were asked about PPE. Employers are allowed to require employees to wear PPE. Then the question is, if you require it, who pays for it? Employers generally are required to pay for PPE, certainly if they're necessary to meet OSHA standards. Employers usually cannot require workers to provide their own PPP. You might have situations where the employee does want to bring their own PPE that they already have, and if you if you don't pay for it and you allow them to do it, just make sure that has to be totally voluntary. So you should be providing the PPE. If an employee wants to, that's fine. It just needs to make sure that it's voluntary. You're not forcing them to use their own PPE. And again, the, uh, I put on the bottom, the employer is still responsible for ensuring that the PPE the employee brings actually is, is appropriate. So you might be faced with a situation where an employee needs an accommodation because what you're providing them is either dangerous to them or they have an allergy. Some people might, for example, have allergies to latex gloves. So then you would be required to provide as a reasonable accommodation non-latex gloves. You might need issues with their breathing where you might have to come up with different masks that they wear, uh, interpreters. So just remember, that the ADA still applies. That is your duty to provide reasonable accommodations and those reasonable accommodations might apply to the PPE itself. So this is really now the major challenge that all of you are gonna face. In one way or another, there's gonna be a, a group of employees who are reluctant to come back to work for all sorts of reasons. It might be that they have an underlying health condition Maybe they have uh, respiratory problems, diabetes, different conditions that the CDC has recognized ex expose them to, to high risk, and they're reluctant to come back to work. Other people might be pregnant that you're not aware of. 
Some employees might have anxiety, high anxiety uh, disorders that make them extremely uh, more nervous about coming back to work. Other people might just have a normal personal fear of getting COVID-19, while others, despite all your efforts, like the fact that they're getting unemployment from the government, enjoy being at home, enjoy working at home if they're teleworking, and frankly, they'd rather keep the status quo as long as possible and not come back to work. So what do you do when you start asking people to return and they refuse? The first thing is to determine whether there's any legal reasons and any legal liabilities or obligations you have to deal with the employee and the basis for why they're not coming back to work. You may have to provide unpaid leave or a leave of absence or some other reasonable accommodation to individuals who are not coming back because they have an underlying health condition, and that makes sense. They mean, might need some reasonable accommodation where they're willing to come back to work, but they need you to go above and beyond what you've already provided to make sure that their particular circumstance is addressed. Again, they might need, for example, additional PPE. What you're providing just doesn't protect them the way that they need to be protected. Typically, someone's personal fear of getting COVID-19 is not gonna be a legitimate reason not to come back to work. And if you chose to fire them, you would more than likely be legally uh, entitled to do so. And as the Department of Labor suggests, in those circumstances, if they're on unemployment, then you would not submit any more partial unemployment claims and you would switch, you would issue them a separation notice and then them would be responsible for filing any type of unemployment claims that they would have. So you kind of see any scenarios, you're gonna see a blending of all these discrimination laws and then the unemployment laws. Uh, you see how they sort of overlap and how you might have to address them in different circumstances. What I would encourage you to do in these circumstances is have conversations with your employees and try to be as flexible as possible to make it work out. Again, as I mentioned before, every government agency is encouraging, strongly encouraging, employers to work with their employees and try to come up with a solution that's going to work. We should all appreciate that everyone has what I think is normal levels of fear about returning to work and being exposed to other people. And as we've talked about, many people have different reasons for that. And I would encourage employers to be respectful, give the benefit of the doubt to your employees and try to accommodate their needs and recognize that it's really a losing battle for you when you force people to come back to work when they're uncomfortable. If you add into that what I mentioned before about unions ramping up their organi organizing activity and ramping up their communications with non-unionized employees and being a source of information and guidance, it's just another incentive for you to work with your employees and make sure that they know that you are working to keep them safe, that their health is a priority for you. So when you get into these situations, understand that there's a lot of legal complications, there's a lot of complexity to it, and I would seek the advice of, whether it's us or someone else, seek the advice of an attorney before you make any termination decisions, and make sure that you have carefully vetted through these types of scenarios because again, they're complicated and they can lead to liability, but I would also encourage you to work uh, and concentrate on coming up with solutions that are gonna be helpful to your employees, give them assurances that you care about their health and make sure that you are providing a safe work environment. And in some circumstances, the information your employees share with you actually might be helpful to you to improve things that you might have overlooked, things that you might not have thought about, and now you have the opportunity to further improve the safety of your workplace, which is what we're all trying to do. Another question is, should an employer document an employee's refusal to return to work? And the answer is absolutely yes. For many reasons, you should document an employee's refusal to return to work, and here's two scenarios. First, from an unemployment law standpoint, if you want to protect yourself and defend a claim, a bogus claim of unemployment, it's important for you to document the exchange you've had with the employee 
So if they file for unemployment themselves, you want to be able to tell your side of the story. So when an employee says, if, if they say, I'm not coming back because frankly, I'm making too much money on unemployment, then you want to memorialize that. And documentation can take any form. It can be a text message. It can be an email. It can be a formal letter that you sign, date, and mail to the employee. But it's essential that you document the communications you have with employees when it comes to their reasons not to come back to work, first from an unemployment standpoint. Then a second scenario. For those of you who had applied and were granted a Paycheck Protection Program, a PPP award, a loan, the Treasury Department in a May FAQ, I believe it was May 19th, the Treasury Department uh, issued an FAQ and they indicated that for loan forgiveness purposes, an employer will not, will not be penalized if they reach out to an employee, make a good faith effort to recall that employee back to their normal work hours, their normal compensation and salary. If the employee rejects that offer, they will not be penalized so long as they document the offer and the rejection. So for PPP loan forgiveness purposes, it's also critical that you document the offer of employment and then the employee's subsequent rejection of that offer. So documentation, as for HR folks, you know how important documentation is. This is just another situation where documentation is very important. So in the two minutes left, I just wanna sh share with you some links to resources from different government agencies, the White House, OSHA, CDC, EEOC, at the state level, look at executive orders from the governors. Those actually constitute law, so you need to comply with them. And our law firm also uh, updates our clients and the public with relevant, timely information on a regular basis. There's a number of blogs we posted about COVID-19 reasons, uh, issues. I provided for you a screenshot of the Department of Labor Claims Conversion Program that I mentioned earlier. So if you have questions about that whole process, you can go to the GDOL. And if you click on the link, they're gonna show you step-by-step step how to file and comply with the claims conversion program so you can unload people from your weekly submissions. And finally, we didn't have time to address the details of the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, but this is the notice that should have been posted at least as early as April 1st. It gives a summary of the obligations under the FFCRA. And I would make sure that if you don't have this already posted, you post this or distribute it to your employees and comply with it. And the final comment I would make is, given all this, this is a great time to pull out your employee handbook and think about all the policies you have that might be triggered by COVID-19. And this is a great time to review those policies and think about whether or not you need to modify PTO policies and other similar policies, travel, et cetera, that need an updating as you decide how you're going to return to work and what your new rules and policies are going to be. So thank you for your time. Uh, we're trying to stick to the 45 minute mark and I think we're there. Okay, Kenny, thank you. Wow, um, you never cease to amaze me with the depth of your knowledge. I wanna remind everybody that if you did submit a question, we're gonna do our best to respond to those. Um, we're going to have a survey that you should be receiving immediately after this webinar. Um, we're going to be having another office hours on May 29 at noon. So you should look in your inbox for that registration. We had at least 76 participants in this webinar today. So we, we thank you very much, all of you who participated, um, for being part of this webinar today. So thank you again. Everybody take care.